Hello everyone, welcome to From the Star Wars Library, where Star Wars is in print, the Force is with the readers, and we return to the Marvel series in December and January of 1981 and 1982. I'm your host here, Nathan P. Butler, and what we see this time are issues 58 and 59 of the Marvel series. They are essentially one storyline. They are two issues that happen effectively concurrently, but they feel like they're two separate stories until you actually read them side by side. Their issue number... 58 here, which says Spacewalk, Death Walk here. This one is entitled Sundown. And then we have issue number 59, which has nothing on the cover other than the you know title and whatnot. This is entitled Bazaar. Now, a couple things about these before we move any further with it. One is you can find this in the pages of Star Wars Omnibus a long time ago, volume three, as with many of the other ones we're covering right now. But this is also one of those rare instances of two issues back to back that form one story that were given the black and white treatment back in classic Star Wars a long time ago, that prestige format series. This is issue number five or volume five of that. If you can see it with all the screen reflecting back on the thing here. So kind of cool to see a story here that I remembered reading from this era of classic Star Wars a long time ago. This is also one where it seems as though this cover perhaps provided some of the inspiration for this cover. I'll show you these side by side here, right? They look kind of similar. Yes. This, of course, is that Star Wars uh, KB Toys special from Dark Horse that reprinted Russ Manning's The Constancia Affair from the newspaper strips run that we looked at quite a while back here in the From the Star Wars Library series. But it's kind of cool to see that back. And also, as with any time that I run into something that's in my collection to show you or show off, as it might be said, um, I not only have this as the original issue here, I also have a second copy of this one. And it's hard to see, but it's down there at the bottom. It is signed by artist Walt Simonson. I have three Star Wars comics from the Marvel series signed by Walt Simonson. This is the first to come up in chronological and release order here. It's an odd pair of tales. It starts out with Lando, Chewbacca, and Luke heading out in the Millennium Falcon to go to a place called Bazaar to meet with a man named Orion Ferret. They're going to buy four TIE Fighters for an upcoming mission, or series of upcoming missions. But then once they're gone, the rest of it pretty much just follows from there with the people still left on Arbra. The idea is pretty straightforward. It seems like there's some science behind it, but it's one of those ones that make you go, wait, what? What happens essentially is that the Rebellion is at Arbra, but they know that just having their fleet in different orbits around Arbra at different times is not going to save them from the Empire if they come snooping around. So you've got these little devices, and you take these, they're referred to as Kurtzberg Field Generators. You take five of them, and they make essentially a pyramid of energy between them that is shielded. The idea is that they will put the Rebel fleet inside that pyramid and move it down into the star's chromosphere uh, by Arbra, and in that way, protect the fleet and save it. And they even have a way to keep it from flying out from the force of going around the sun. They will use sort of a booster rocket on top of it, or an impulse engine, whatever you want to call it, up on top of it, to keep it with some kind of thruster, there you go, thruster is probably the best generic word here, to keep it from doing so, to keep it in the right orbit inside the star. Kind of an interesting way of going about it. They wind up getting inside, it works pretty well, until everybody leaves, and accidentally leaves C-3PO and R2-D2 behind, which winds up being a very good thing, because things stop working. Uh, there are some malfunctions that go on, and it's up to the droids to save the day. And they do manage to. The crew aboard the, sh the ship, the, aboard the like command center, winds up being knocked out by noxious fumes. They wind up being able to get out. It's essentially C-3PO and R2 zipping around there outside. And they realize that if they plug the pyramid thing, the generators, into a power source from one of the ships in the fleet... That'll give it the extra boost of power it needs to keep it solid and save the fleet from destruction inside the star. A great moment of the droids saving the day, which does not happen all that much in this. It kind of has the feel in some respects of something like Nomad Droids, perhaps, or uh, the Secret Weapons episode of The Clone Wars, except done in a way that has enough of the other characters to not feel like it is an overdone 
droid story. But it is the droids saving the day, uh, Will Wheaton style, so to speak, Wesley Crusher style, so to speak, here when no one else can. They also, remember this is David Michelinie and Walt Simonson in the era where they're building up Shira Bree, as you heard me very enthusiastically describe early on. We have another appearance here of Shira. Even though Luke is gone, there's a possibility that they may need Luke to be the pilot to save the day with this. And she says, if you want Princess, I'll be happy to go after Luke and offer to take his place. She answers, thank you, Lieutenant Bree, finally spelling it right, B-R-I-E, but that won't be necessary. Commander Skywalker's project is as vital as this one, and he's needed here. Though I'm sure you'd enjoy making your offer to him personally. To which she replies, indeed, Princess, almost as much as Luke would. Bye. That issue then leaves things with us jumping to Lando and Luke, who are then held briefly at gunpoint. We pick up the next issue there, Bazaar, with them still held at gunpoint. But this is all essentially happening concurrently, so we're sort of jumping back and forth in time in that first issue to make this all work concurrently. Very much the uh, a Courtship of Princess Leia style jumping back and forth through time in the way you're telling it versus the way it's supposed to be. Essentially what happens here is that Ferret says, yeah, yeah, I got your TIE Fighters, but uh, you're going to have to go to this place called Patch 4 because you're going to have to pick them up from this junk world where I've hidden them. And it's essentially a trap for Lando and Luke so they can be destroyed by this huge creature, this big pink, uh, almost like a sand worm type of creature here, um, that is in theory going to kill them and let uh, Ferret keep the money and keep the ship. But they leave Chewbacca behind as an insurance policy. If we're not back in one hour, and one hour does not seem like enough time here, uh, if we're not back in one hour, kill Ferret. So they take off, they got their insurance policy, they wind up meeting some of the, the local hobos essentially, under the surface of the junk planet, and finally wipe out the creature, or defeat the creature, so that they can get the four TIE Fighters that they came for, which ends the day nicely with them going back to Arbra. Bear in mind, however, this is kind of a bizarre tale, because it is another instance of the Marvel series using real-world materials, um, just like I believe it is in... Gosh, I forget which one it is. There's a story uh, later on in the Marvel series where there's a foreign translation where it refers to some of the actions of some of the characters as being like Hitler. I think it's Lando that describes it that way. And of course, that's not in the English translation, but you might say, wait a second, how does Star Wars characters know about Hitler a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away? Well, here we have this creature, but cre the creature's name, or creature, creature, is named Caesar. Why is he named Caesar? Probably for one reason only, a stupid pun from Luke, from Shakespeare in which the hobo leader says, some of the boys tried to stop the beast before, but only succeeded in being its afternoon snack. Lando says, then maybe we can help. To which Luke says, we have to. After all, we didn't come to feed Caesar. We came to bury him. Thankfully, the other characters say, huh? What? Beg pard? Yeah, not beg your pardon, but beg pard? Yeah. Luke is quoting Shakespeare in the galaxy far, far away here, and it's not the only time that'll happen within the Marvel series. Uh, I guess they forgot the whole long time ago in a galaxy far, far away thing. So it's a decent, interconnected pair of tales, but the broader impact of this is they've got the four Starfighters now, the four TIE Fighters, and Shira is still there. They're still building up her character. We'll see these come to fruition in the near future together, the TIE Fighters and Shira, but that's a few issues and episodes down the line. So, these two issues, Sundown and Bazaar, are they essential reads? I would say no. They're essential for the Marvel series. You need to see how they get the TIE Fighters, perhaps, and see the buildup of Shira, perhaps. But it's not as essential as some of the other ones in that storyline. It's definitely not essential, though, for the modern Star Wars reader. If you skipped forward, you could just say, well, they must have captured some TIE Fighters somewhere, and all would be well. So not an essential tale, but a continuation of that Michelini script, that Michelini storyline that's eventually going to lead us to the big moments with Shira and Luke and what will eventually give way to her becoming Lumaya. It's starting here. As always, thank you for watching, and may the Force be with the readers.